Cinema Jaw is sponsored by Cards Against Humanity. They asked us not to read an ad. Enjoy the show. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rye the Movie Guy, and sitting inside the fish tank is Phil Me and Phil. How's it going, guys? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we get ready for the fall movie season with our fall movie preview. I gotta say, man, you seem extremely excited this week. Oh, absolutely, and I think you know why. I do, I do. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. It's a little teaser. Yes, it, we always used to joke that the summer movie season was sort of your season with the big blockbusters and the popcorn movies, and that the fall movie season was mine with the more serious Oscar contenders and dramas coming out. But I think we've sort of blended here because lately, I think the Hollywood seasons have sort of blended. You you get some big action movies and big comedies, tentpole movies, even in the fall. Yeah, they seem to, to hold most of the, the superhero stuff for the summer. But you're, you're right, you're right. We're, we've got some, some interesting genre films coming out. And we had a Cinema Jaw meeting today, and we were talking, and, and you even said, doing the research for your fall movie preview. I barely got out of October. Yeah, because you're just so excited oh, about so many films. Such a great slate of movies coming out. I uh, have a little bit different of a fall movie preview this this week because I've seen a lot of the movies. That's right. I was at the Toronto International Film Festival. Just just drop it on us like yes. that, huh? And it was awesome, Matt. I bet. Th- this is why you're so excited. This yes. is why you're beaming. Oh, totally. Um, this was my first time at uh, TIFF, and I saw a lot of familiar faces. Brian Tallarico, mm-hmm. a regular here on uh, Cinema Jaw. Also, Eric Childress and other... Uh, critics from saw, Chicago. Saw Pam. Saw Pam. Who's been on the show. Right. Got to hang out with them, see some movies, and it, it literally, for a, a movie fan, it is it is literally heaven because you're, you're running around from big premiere to big premiere, putting my name down for press to do red carpet interviews. Which you did. Which I did. We got three big red carpet interviews, and we'll get to those. We're going to be playing those throughout all fall when we get to these big movies. I got to talk to the likes of Antonio Banderas and Eddie Murphy. So it was extremely exciting. And then not only that, you're waking up the next day at like eight in the morning, they're starting movies. And I love a cup of coffee and a movie. It, it, it was it was literally like... Do you get a heaven. snack to go with the coffee? I, I like ended a crumpet up, or yeah, you a know what, scone? I ended up buying like breakfast bars. Okay. And I would bring a breakfast bar with me and then I'd grab a Starbucks at the theater. And I would watch something like uh, Renee Zellweger in, in Judy, in which she uh, portrays Judy Garland. Oh, yeah. Shockingly fantastic performance by what I used to call her sourpuss Zellweger. She's incredible in this one. Got to give credit where credit's due. It's probably the, the best performance I've seen so far this year. Better but, than Jerry Maguire? Yes, this oh, is her, wow. her best. And I would be seeing this at like 8.15 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then that would just roll into another movie. Uh, all told, I was there for five days. I saw 20 films. That's a lot, dude. And did three red carpets, met up with uh, a jawhead. Uh, it, it was a total blast. Didn't drop the name. He helped you out a bit, didn't he? Yes. Just, Justin. Justin Rayford? I think that's how I say his last name. Justin actually uh, met him for beers. He's a producer on a couple of films, and he runs in that Elias Rodriguez crowd of filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So he reached out when he had heard that I was going to be at uh, Toronto, and it ended up being a blessing because he ended up helping me with the audio for one of the red carpets, and that was for the laundromat. So the audio that we get, thank you, Justin, because I think it's the best audio that we got out of the three was when he actually helped me. It's it's nice to have somebody to help you. Oh, for sure. So that was a, a big, big helpful hand that he gave. Great time. Maybe next year, Matt, you're going to get there. But the, the five to. films that I have on my fall movie preview are five films that I've seen at Toronto, and they're basically like my top five list. So it's not even a preview for you. You've, right. you've already seen them. Yes. So I'm going to give sort of like recap, uh, you know, little capsule reviews, I should say. These are recommendations. Recommendations to be excited for these five films. And then yourself and also our guest, Matt. We yes. do have a guest. We do indeed, yes. Peter Collins Campbell is joining us. He's got a new film coming out, Dimland, and I uh, can't wait to talk to him. I agree. Um, he has his five 
movies picked out as well I know. that he's excited for. This is an exciting time of year. It sure I is. I mean, Halloween's coming. The weather's starting to get a little cooler. It's nice. Although not this week, but... And one other note. This episode marks 10 years of Cinema Junk. It's official, right? It is. We have now been doing this for 10 years. Yeah. And you famously remember this because the first film we ever uh, reviewed was Nine, which came out on 9909. Great way to mark it. Yeah. It works. Because if it was any other movie, to be absolutely honest, we may have never known the exact weekend. We would have been like, oh, it was sometime in either early September, or we would probably yeah. forget. We'd have to look it up all the time. But the fact that we know that we reviewed nine and that it was released on 9909, we know it's been 10 years. Yeah. So happy anniversary, buddy. Happy anniversary. 10 years. It's wow. crazy. Crazy. All right. We you haven't, got a you lot haven't going aged on. a day. No. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You either, Matt. You, you look the same, except for that ridiculous haircut that you I have. love my haircut. All right. We even have more going on besides all of this, this fun excitement that we just talked about, don't we, Phil? Yeah, Ryan. We are also going to be going eye for an eye on the new Brad Pitt movie, Ad Astra. And we have reviews of The Goldfinch and Art Paul of Playboy, The Man Behind the Bunny. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Also, because we're going eye for an eye on Ad Astra, I thought this is a good time, Matt, for you to take Peter on in Brad Pitt movie trivia. Okay. All right. All right. He's got a lot of films under his belt. A lot to choose yeah, from. And, and more every day. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, we're celebrating Nicole Kidman all month of September. It's a jam-packed job. So let's start with a Nicole Kidman fact. Yes. Today's Nicole Kidman fact is about the 2004 movie, The Stepford Wives. Nicole Kidman accepted the role in the film when she had learned she would be working with Frank Oz, the director. However... It didn't turn out very well. The The film infamously had a lot of production issues, and there were a lot of crashes between Frank and Nicole Kidman, uh, also the other star, Bette Midler. Uh, later in the interviews, Nicole Kidman, Matthew Broderick, and the producer, Scott Rudin, had all said that they regretted even being involved with this film. Uh <laughs> Uh, Kidman almost had left the project because she was so unhappy with the rewrites. Uh, later on, Frank Oz would also go on to say that he regrets his involvement uh, in general, stating that he made too many mistakes and he, he cared too much about what the studios wanted and what the audience wanted. Uh, and ultimately, he delivered a substandard product. Well, that was a rough movie. I remember. Every yeah. Nicole Kidman fact I think we've had so far has been about how terrible shooting has been for her. <laughs> I, don't, I, may, I feel like there's one common theme in all of these. Bad luck Kidman, huh? Maybe she's the problem. <laughs> maybe she's maybe, why, oh, maybe she's uh, why Baz know, Luhrmann man. was so hard on her <laughs> no. and, and uh, Stanley Kubrick was so hard on her. Well, stay away from the Stepford Wives if, if you haven't seen it. No need to, to rush out and see that one. I don't know. Christopher Walken's pretty good. Hmm. All right, Matt. Without further ado, let's bring in our guest. You mentioned Peter Collins Campbell has a new movie entitled Dimland, which is nearing completion. Yes. Peter, welcome to Cinema Jaw. Hi, thank you. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Yeah, nice <laughs> to meet you. Um, so Dimland, me and Matt were, were talking before we had hit record about the premise of this film. Mm. It's very interesting. Uh, give us the sales pitch to the Jawheads about what Dimland is about. Sure. Um, there's there's kind of like I have found like there's kind of two ways to talk about this movie. There's one way to like film nerds, film nerds, uh, and then there's kind of like a more generalized uh, pitch of it. You're talking uh, to film nerds. Yeah. So the I in the treatment that I made for the movie, I basically pitched it as early Jim Jarmusch characters accidentally find their way into a Tartakovsky movie, which. It's is, a very film nerd way of describing it. It is absolutely the nerd. I've said that to so many people, and they're just like, what? what? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, the more generalized kind of way of describing it is um, it is to spirited away what Hook is to Peter Pan. It's like a person that has this kind of experience with a like surreal kind of metaphysical place, sort of like forgets about it and becomes an adult. And uh, in in this movie, the character Bryn um, is kind of going through a like quarter life crisis. Uh, it doesn't go too deep into it, but she, you know, is just graduating college and and kind of not dealing with adult life very well. She's in a very codependent relationship and she decides to 
uh, just kind of impulsively escape what little she has going on in the city, and they go to this old farm that her uncle owned. Um, and she has all of these very nostalgic memories with it, uh, and she wants to just kind of like recapture some of that nostalgia. But when they get there, it's been torn down and replaced with like an Airbnb hostel uh, that her uncle never told her family about. So she has a bad reaction to that, understandably. And then they just decide to kind of like squat there uh, for a little while. And as they're there, they start noticing these sort of signs that they're like not alone on this property, which it's been like 10 years, so she doesn't know exactly who you lives know, there, who what's lives going there, on. If there's like a groundskeeper, but there are like fires on the edge of the forest at night and, you know, sounds in the woods and stuff. And then just kind of out of nowhere, uh, what appears to be like a person wearing a mask that knows her name shows up. And I love that mask that you used. I saw in the... Yeah, it's a beautiful mask. <laughs> Uh, we got uh, this guy, Dennis Preston, to make that out of wood, uh, which it, he did it very quickly, and it was awesome. It really is. It's a cool one. Um, and then from there, she just uh, starts remembering aspects of this experience that she had as a, as a child, uh, and it she gets kind of sucked deeper and deeper into this sort of like other world, uh, and it starts driving kind of a even deeper wedge in between her and her boyfriend. Um, and she kind of has to like figure out, you know, what world she wants to inhabit by the end of it. Sounds awesome. It does, man. Now what's inter interesting too is, is you ran uh, a campaign to raise money to sort of finish the movie. Yeah. So. Walk us through the, the actual filmmaking process because sure. it, it seemed that you were able to accomplish so much with so little to start. It's like but a shoestring. Yeah, right? But Less then, than a shoestring. But then that <laughs> last leap that you need to make, which is the sound yeah. and the color correction and all that stuff, costs money to go and get that yeah. done. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, there is probably a shoestring way to do that. Some would say that the way that we're doing it is still shoestring, but um, we, so we shot the film and uh, this was last November. Um, and I, I did raise what little money was spent on the movie, like literally just off of dog walking. We shot with a, a budget of like all told maybe 9,000. Um, and just like everyone was working basically for like the ability to pay rent for the month. We hold up. That's, in this... that's more than a lot of indie productions. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was um, obviously very generous of everyone involved. Um, but like, yeah, we were able to give everyone a little something. And it was written for all of these parameters, uh, which was like integral. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the actors actually, his dad had just bought farmland. <laughs> So we, we went to Asheville and we shot in the mountains and it was amazing. But so after that, you know, we had spent all of that and then I edited it myself over the last, you know, eight, six, eight months. Um, but when we got to the point where it was like we were starting to do test screenings and stuff, I was just like, I don't know how, like we actually managed to get some really, I'm confident enough to say like, above what you would expect for that budget, like kind of visuals for the film. Um, our DP, Josh Kundrat Gibbs, just like did an incredible job. Um, but like the sound was not like- Where you wanted it to be. Right. We shot it like a mumblecore movie. Mm -hmm. Love mumblecore. Sure. Um, very inspired by mumblecore. But mumblecore can get away with a roughness that is just built into the charm of like what it is. And when you're having, like, these shots that are, like, you know, like, mountains and, like, it looks like a painting or something, like, you're not going to want to hear, like, blobs. But uh, so I luckily, with this short film, Summer Vacation, that I did, uh, it had gone to festivals and stuff, and um, it premiered at Kukaloris last year. Uh, and I met some wonderful people from this sound studio, Studio Unknown, uh, because my film screened with a feature, uh, and they were all there to support the feature because they had done work on it. Networking, that's yeah. great. Um, and that feature is called Eight Slices, which is probably 
out now. That's an anthology Throw it horror. In the fish tank. Eight right. slices. No, it's uh, it's like a very sweet comedy. Okay, about, totally thinking of something else. Yeah, uh, Nick Westfall is the director okay. of that. Um, super charming and uh, just kind of like John Hughesy, people at a pizza place in a little town. <laughs> a very great movie um but yeah so they all they were all there and you know i just met them all they were the sweetest people ever and we stayed in touch and then when it came time to you know think about sound i sent it to them and they got me an assessment in like two days and i just like there's no reason why like a whole company should like be that excited about some little project that's going to get them no profit. Mm-hmm. And like they were that excited and I was just like I appreciate that so much. So they're we did in the a business of making making art, right? So yeah. there you go. They did the sound for Patterson, which is on yeah. Netflix. Mm-hmm. Good movie. Yeah. Jim Jarmusch. Uh oh, oh my god, not Patterson. Paddleton. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Paddleton. So what when can we expect the film to be finished? We are aiming for uh, early November. Nice. And there is a Kickstarter happening it's as we a, it, speak, right? He, he has reached it. Yeah, it's done. Oh, it's done. Yeah. Well, yeah. And thanks. he reached his goal. Yeah. Congratulations. So thank you, everyone, for that. So that for the amazing. Jawheads that want to follow the film and get updates, is yeah. there a website or somewhere to guide them to check it out? I would say that the most active thing right now is the Instagram, which is at uh, Dimland Movie. Do it, Jawheads. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, did want to ask, I, I saw in your bio here that you worked with Chance the Rapper. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was that like? Uh, it was my first music video experience in Chicago. Um, I had started hanging out with people in his circle. Um, and the music video is for... Do they all wear the, the Chance hat? So that's why you know it's This was pre-Chance circle. hat. Okay. <laughs> this was pre-Chance hat. This was pre-Acid Rap, actually, or just post-Acid Rap. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a music video for one of his collaborator, Nico Segal's, uh, solo song. And, uh, he, he was featured on it as well as Vic Mensa. So, you know, we, we spent an evening hanging out and, and shooting stuff. And I see him around from time to time in Chicago areas. It's he fun. hangs around. He's a good guy. He is. <laughs> uh, for the jawheads that want to follow you on, uh, all the social medias, do you have a, a handle to guide him to? Sure. Uh, again, I've kind of abandoned everything that's not Instagram for whatever reason. That seems to be the going trend. Twitter makes me have panic attacks. Because <laughs> it's pretty damn scary. It's really funny. It's the funniest social media platform, but also it's like mixed in with this just terrifying hyper-awareness of everything going on in the world. Yeah. There's really no filter bad. on it. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. So Instagram is like cool, lots of cool art. Maybe a little too much self-promotion, but I can deal with that. So Instagram is uh, at PCC Films. We like to end all of these guest interviews with a silly cinema cue. We're celebrating Nicole Kidman. Phil, you got something for Peter? Wonderful. Yes, uh, I do, Peter. This week, I'm going to change it up a little bit. It's less of a question. It's a question, but it's, it's a hypothetical situation for you. This week's cinema cue, I wanted to ask you which form of torture would be worse, do you think? Uh, in one situation, you're locked in a room and you're forced to watch Batman Forever on repeat for mm. the rest of your life. Mm. And in the other situation, you are locked in the same room and forced to watch the Bewitched reboot for the rest of your Ooh. life, both starring Nicole Kidman. Which one would be worse or preferable? Either or. And why? Batman Forever is Joel Schumacher, correct? Mm-hmm. Um, damn. Both are fascinating film studies, I think. Uh, is that the Val Kilmer Batman? Yes, it is. Man. Um, I get... Oh, God. <laughs> this is torture. He's really taking it seriously. No, There's no I, winner. I mean... Oh, man. Bewitched reboot is Will Ferrell, right? Yes. Yeah. I never saw that. Uh, I'm sure it's awful, <laughs> but... I guess Batman Forever... Be- I would prefer Batman Forever mm-hmm. because I feel like there is so much going on in that movie. Like there it, has to be at least one good thing. It's well, you don't have to enjoy it. You just like you take it in. You know, like yeah. the production design is gaudy, but it's like whoa, <laughs> they made all that stuff. I liked it as a kid. Yeah, I mean, you know, Tommy Lee Jones, Two Face, notwithstanding. <laughs> I feel like you could adopt some kind of like Stockholm syndrome with that movie. I yeah. could see enjoying it after maybe 30 watches. Wow. Wow. 
don't At know. At least there's that. no bat nipples. My head hurts thinking about it. Did they remove them for that one? That there, the, this is pre bat nipple. Okay. That mm-hmm. was that was the next movie that. The, In that case, then I've heard some people defend it as actually not that bad. Oh. I got to tell you, I prefer Val Kilmer's Batman to perhaps even Michael Keaton. He's not a bad Batman. He had the stoicism down. That is a hot take. <laughs> I know. I know. We could we could do an entire podcast on that alone. Wow. <laughs> not saying he's the best Batman, just I mean, saying I liked him. Yeah. People hate on it. I don't. To make uh-huh. the punishment worse, now you have to be locked in that same room watching Batman Forever, but you also have to be sitting next to Matt Kay giving commentary <laughs> about Batman Forever. Uh, give me bewitched. <laughs> Bat nipples. Good stuff. I, I did want to note that Nicole Kidman, who we're celebrating here all month, was at Toronto International. Oh, nice. And I got to see her at the Goldfinch premiere. I was trying to get her attention to let her know that Cinema Jaw is celebrating her career, mm-hmm. but she, she didn't catch she my, kn- she knows. my hand signals. But she, she's she probably, listening. She probably heard. She saw you, yeah. and she's like, oh, I don't need to talk to Rye again. So Peter Collins Campbell is sitting in on this entire jaw. He has his top five uh, fall movies that he's looking forward to. Brings us to a segment called Eye for an Eye. Phil, what do we got? Yes, this week on Eye for an Eye, Ad Astra. Astronaut Roy McBride undertakes a mission across an unforgiving solar system to uncover the truth about his missing father and his father's doomed expedition that now, 30 years later, threatens the entire universe. The film stars Brad Pitt, Liv Tyler, Ruth Nega, and Tommy Lee Jones. It is directed by James Gray, who previously directed The Lost City of Z and The Immigrant. Rye, we throw it over to you, pal. You know, I'm a sucker for an astronaut movie. Space could be some time travel when we're when we're talking about space and he's cutting across the solar system uh, I, i'm a little disappointed they use tommy lee jones as the father i don't know why, why? i don't know i think i it find him like i find him pretty interesting at this choice. time i don't know but uh, brad pitt space movie interesting premise i'm interested okay this this seems like kind of a broy version of annihilation to me mm. that that's sort huh. of the what they're going for with this. Yeah. I've heard comparisons to Interstellar. I was going to say. Interstellar-esque. Sort of a trippy space movie, right? This year's trippy space movie. Science fiction space movie. Um, I love me some Brad Pitt. I do love Tommy Lee Jones, actually. I think the casting is fantastic. Uh, They managed to make them look like a believable father and son. So I'm interested. But I have trepidation. (laughs) Peter? I think that the trailers have, like, prestige, like, all over them um so i'm trying not to like buy into it too much uh i am however very interested because of one shot in the trailer besides that it just looks fun but like there is a shot which i believe has people in rovers on the moon using lasers and i think that rocks so yeah wow (laughs) yeah rovers and lasers yeah they're shooting lasers on the moon like I'm sold. I uh, They're probably so shooting all the tardigrades. I I made the comparison to Interstellar from the synopsis and was initially like it sounds kind of like a two cent version. Six years later, I will say rovers on the moon shooting lasers 100% 180. <laughs> yeah. That changes everything. Are they like okay? So there was a first trailer and I was like uh, okay. I mean this space is cool, but I don't really know what else to make about this movie. But then the second trailer came out and I was like I'm actually very interested. And that's the space laser trailer. <laughs> oh, does it say what they're shooting with lasers? They're shooting at each other. There's it's like a Mad Max race on the moon with lasers. That does that that is 100%. Well, well yes. <laughs> I am so far in the opposite direction now. I am entirely yeah. interested. Hey, Ad Aster marketing team, we know you're listening. Lead with the space lasers. Absolutely. Four interested for Ad Aster. Got to get a review Ad out for Astra. the Astra. Astra. Yeah. Got to get a review out for the Jawheads. Yeah, we do. Keep wanting to say Ed Astor. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's what's messing with me. It's a weird title, for sure. Uh, Speaking of new movies, Matt, the new film The Goldfinch is adapted from the New York Times bestselling book of the same name. It's a book that won the Pulitzer Prize. Sometimes adapting a book with such acclaim can prove to be a challenge. Is The Goldfinch a work of art that deserves to be in a museum? I attended the premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival to find out. When I lost her, I lost sight of any landmark that might have led me someplace happier. You 
you the boy, are you? The boy whose mother was killed. The short answer to my question, is the goldfinch a work of art that deserves a spot in a museum? Hell no. The slow-moving drama tells the story of Theodore, who is just a young kid when he and his mother visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art the day of a terrorist attack. A bomb explodes in the museum, killing many people, including Theodore's mother. However, Theodore survives the attack, as does the famous painting, The Goldfinch. In fact, young Theo actually takes the painting with him as he leaves the rubble. In time, people come to believe that the painting was destroyed in the bombing. This is all told in flashbacks from the older Theodore, played by Anzel Elgort. He lives in guilt as he thinks the reason why they were at the museum that day is his fault. We see what happened to him in the aftermath. Because his father was not part of his life, he goes to live with family friends. Nicole Kidman here plays the mother of that family that takes Theo in as another son. We see how he meets Hobby, an antique furniture collector. We see later that his father comes back into his life and moves him west. It's here that he meets his best friend, Boris, played by Stranger Things actor Finn Wolfhard. This is the most entertaining part of the movie when these two young kids meet. Eventually, he makes his way back to New York, and there is a twist involving the fate of the Goldfinch painting. But by the time you get there, you just don't care. Director John Crawley has made one of the most sterile films I have seen this year. I was never drawn into any of the drama, the characters, or the fate of the painting. Sarah Polson, who plays Theo's stepmom, was at the screening after the movie, and she talked about reading the book and how involved she was with the characters in the book that she actually kept leaving like 30 pages left to read so that she never quite finished the book. Well, that does not at all translate to the big screen. The Goldfinch movie is slow, uninteresting, and lacking any emotion. Stay away from this one. Maybe you could have left 30 minutes early, so you would have <laughs> right? left a little... It, it, it was funny. After it ended, you're always like, wow, I, you know, these are like the first times people are seeing the, the movie. So I, I thought, God, this is awful. I wonder what anybody else is thinking. Our friend Brian Tallarico, I saw on his Twitter, he, he summed it up perfectly. He sent out a tweet that said, the Goldfinch is the longest movie of the year. Don't fact check me. Just believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and he just nailed it. You know, it, it clearly isn't the longest movie of the year, but it sure feels like it's yeah. the longest movie oh, of the year. Oh, that's a shame, man. I literally, just watching the trailer was like checking my watch. It was. Honestly. I, it was, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure the storyline, because it, it is sort, sort of bizarre, this idea that he has this painting, what happened to the painting. Who cares? Right. Well, that's the thing. I think in, in book form, it's it's able to to get into the the it's character's emotion, and you, you start to really care about these people mm. and and his friendship with Hobby, uh, who's who's making the, this furniture and antique furniture and sort of putting it back together and restoring stuff. All of that's pretty interesting, but on screen it doesn't come across at all. It's just like come on, get to the point. What yeah. the hell happened to the painting? And it takes forever to get there. And then when it does, it's like, I, I really don't care. I really don't care. Where, where is the exit? You know, I just want to get out of the theater. That's yeah. a shame. So. How's Nicole Kidman in it? Nick, Nick, she's not, not a big enough role where you would say like, wow, you got to see this for no Nicole Kidman. But she's so pretty small. great. She, she's good. It's just a small, smaller role. Yeah. So. All right. What about a favorite scene? Anything good? Uh, I wouldn't even go favorite scene. I'll give it to the, the actor from Stranger Things. This is that uh, Finn Wolfhard who is also in, he's in It also, isn't he? Wow. So he plays this Russian kid named Boris when they meet, and he's his dad's, like, you know, always working, and so he more or less has the house to himself. So he's, he's able to, like, grab drinks and get into drugs, and, and it's just hilarious These because they're, they're pretty young, you know? And that part of it is fun. At least got some laughter and some emotion into the movie. At least you were affected one way you know instead yeah. of just sitting there looking at moving he, images he, he may have also been the best part of it chapter one to be honest he was great yeah he is he's, he's a great actor i he like is. him he was i don't know if you guys have seen the pup music videos that he's in no it's a punk band from canada 
So uh, I was just talking about that band with Patrick out there. Oh, out really? Front. Yep. Mm-hmm. They have a music video that actually predates Stranger Things that is that Finn Wolfhard is in. Huh. And he's playing like a fictionalized version of one of the band members. And then they did a sequel after Stranger Things with another song. And he's just, that kid's got it. He does. And <laughs> so he was also at the premiere, you know, so they'd all come out there. And it's, you got all these stars on stage. You got like Nicole Kidman and Sarah Paulson. But he sort of stole the show at the premiere, too. He was telling jokes. Like he's very yeah. comfortable and confident young actor i i I was taken aback that's yeah i mean especially since his character on stranger things is sort of like the nerdy kid Mm -hmm. anyway uh what about all pretty nerdy fair fair (laughs) he's sort of the leader of the nerds that's true well he's the 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 good looking nerd yeah um what about a a bad scene anything so so again not the rest of the movie yeah not (laughs) so much just a scene but the pacing i mean it just felt so long and just you, you gotta have some peaks in there besides this Boris coming on where, where you finally were laughing a little bit. There was no other peaks that draw you in one way or the other. It it's was a just shame, too man. slow moving. This is, this is a, would have been a tentpole of, of the Oscar season. Um, all right, any influences here? I, it reminded me of the movie Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Yikes. That was also very shallow and poor, you know, not well received and, and kind of boring. Yeah. And it had that kind of also feeling, like it didn't seem attack. also about a terrorist attack, and it didn't it didn't feel authentic enough. And either does the goldfinch. You just don't buy it's these kind of hollow, huh? Yep. Hmm. Did you learn anything? Uh, I learned you can mess up a great story. Um, great books don't necessarily translate to great movies. And, and here's a, another example. This is an age old lesson, Ryan. It is. Um, all right, leave us off with the movie poster quote. I see it. I see it now. I see the the poster, and underneath it, it says a golden mistake. Nice. You like, I like that it. one? Yeah. One jaw from Rye the Movie Guy on the Goldfinch. Wow. One jaw. And that, that jaw may, is for Boris. That may be the lowest you've graded a movie all year. So if you've seen Goldfinch and, and for some reason you did like it and you want to argue with me at Cinema Jaw on Twitter. Bring it, yeah. Or write us an <laughs> email, feedback at cinemajaw.com. All right, Matt. Fall movie preview. Again, I've seen my top five in Toronto. Stop so, bragging already. So I'm going to be able to sort of give really strong recommendations and maybe i've seen some that pop up on your list as well we always like to start with the guest peter was this a fun list to come up with did you did you have five Absolutely. that you were you were thrilled about i had i had five that i knew were coming out that i like was interested in but then i just kind of like delved in and just started watching trailer after trailer, trailer after trailer yeah. and uh i mean honestly you said you you had trouble getting past october i think i didn't even get halfway through october uh, for real like the first so week much, of october is huge i didn't even know there was a pedro almodovar movie coming yep. out like uh, god pain and glory um so yeah i mean i've got i've got like i got like 10 but <laughs> nice. like you know i narrowed it down yeah um, we'll, we'll get to honorable mentions at the end what okay. do you got sitting at number five number five for me is first love uh by takashi mike um, because I just saw Ichi the Killer for the first time last year at Music Box. And I've still was, never seen that. What a, I mean, I can't say that I ever want to watch it again, but it's crazy. It made me feel insane. Uh, so I need to see more of his movies, and this just looks like a really, it looks kind of like Japanese Baby Driver almost. Uh, hmm. Not with cars, though, just kind of like with underground uh like people j- trying to escape other shady people uh and it seems graphic kind of style uh it looks well it's definitely more toned down than each of the killer it looks like but it looks like he hasn't really had that style for a few years but it looks fun and very violent hmm. well i know that each of the killer is is very highly regarded yeah I mean, the style in that, I mean, you get older and there's less times that you have that feeling of like, I've never seen a style like this. And Ichi the Killer was like, at 25, me feeling that. Hmm. Just looking at the synopsis I I have here is that uh, a self-confident young boxer and a prostitute get caught up in a drug smuggling plot involving organized crime, corrupt cops, and a female assassin. Yakuza. (laughs) How can't you be excited about that? I'm in. I'm and sure they use like some old like '50s doo wop in the trailer as all the stuff is going on. It looks fun. Showing a release date of September 27th. Nice. Mark that one down. Not even in October yet. Yeah. All right, that swings it around to my number five, and this is where I put 
uh, the new one from Robert Eggers, The Lighthouse. Nice. It's coming out uh, October 18th, I believe. And it features, from what I'm hearing, this is the buzz out of Toronto, right? I don't know if you, if you are familiar with this <laughs> film festival they have in Canada. Career high performances from both of those actors. I believe it. Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson, if I didn't mention the two leads. Yep. Yeah. And that's saying something. That is really saying something. What was the movie uh, a couple years ago? Um, Sean Baker with, with Willem Dafoe. Florida Project. Florida mm-hmm. Project. One of my favorites. I loved Absolutely. it. Loved it. And, and I thought that might have been a, a career high. And this guy, I mean, Willem Dafoe has had some incredible, <laughs> incredible performances. Even uh, Being Vincent, was that the name of the Vincent right. Van Gogh? Yeah. Was fantastic. And pretty much because of him. And yeah, Pattinson, kind of boring. I've liked him more and more every time I see him. You know, I mean, I'm starting to forgive the sparkling vampire stuff. I'm in like lighthouse, sea monsters, weird stuff going on. So this is one that I saw in Toronto. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Here we go. And I'm glad it's on your list because this is a great movie. It's a wonderful follow up to The Witch. And you're right. The performance is both by Defoe and Pattinson on point. Fantastic. It's got this uh, four by three ratio of filming it's in black and white they use a lot of close-ups on the actors with the strange lighting that you would have dim lighting in a in a lighthouse yeah but but very saturated it almost looks Mm -hmm. like um not 300 um uh sin city it's very high contrast yes i mean just like i i'm not a horror movie guy but like seeing the first picture that came out of that movie with the two of them both looking just gaunt uh like it just looks like a photograph from that time period right like it with no ch- like cheats yeah. to they just make you th- they nailed it yeah and I, you yeah. know what he does he, he he achieves exactly that atmosphere that he, he achieved in the witch you know it's the atmosphere atmosphere horror that love that of the time this time it's you're trapped on this little you know island and, and lighthouse and it's just the two of them and don't count out the sound design. See it in the theater because the sound design was amazing. Wow. It creeps you out. Nice. Never so. seen The Witch. Oh. Ooh, good one. The v- v- Witch. Yeah, you need to see it. Yes. So I did see The Lighthouse. That was a, a great one. My number five film that I saw at uh, Toronto comes out November 22nd, and it's got everybody's favorite actor, Tom Hanks, playing Mr. Rogers in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And I think going into this movie, my biggest fear was going to be that they were just basically making a drama of the wonderful documentary that we got about Mr. Rogers, sure. uh, what was it, two years ago. And so, but instead, they give you this, this tender film that hits you right in the heart, and it's done in the style of the, the Mr. Rogers show. So you're basically getting almost an episode of Mr. Rogers Whoa. with a movie. And I, I don't think any other actor could have uh, played fred rogers the way tom hanks does because the compassion that he has and you you got to have that trust you know how we feel about mr rogers in in a strange way you feel that way about tom hanks like he's just sure. a good person and you like him and i'll just say this because i don't want to give it away um there, there's a, a moment in this movie that is really special you know how we do our favorite scenes of the year it's no doubt going to be on a lot of people's list for a moment in this movie that just is amazing. It, it, it actually gets the viewer involved in the film. Do you think it'll get more people to go back and watch the documentary, which I thought was actually fantastic, but underappreciated, great. underwatched? I hope so. The more people that see it, the people that watched it appreciated it, but I don't think enough people watched it. I guess I feel like I remember seeing a lot of people saying they were going to go watch it because a lot of people watched the trailer. I feel like I saw a lot of like Facebook and like Twitter people saying like, oh my God, I'm already crying. And blah, throw, blah, blah. throw that in the, mm-hmm. the fish tank too, what the box office was of the yeah. documentary on Mr. Rogers. Because I think it did pretty good. And also the actor from The Americans, uh, Matthew Reese, Rias, yeah. I don't know how you say his last name. He is, this is a career best for him. Yeah. He plays the reporter interviewing uh, Mr. Rogers and he's awesome in there. He's, it's like kind of a, he's like the cynic or something. Right, yeah. he is. Everyone's totally looking, cynic, yeah, they're looking, cynical. they're looking for something like that wrong. Mr. Rogers does wrong, right? right. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's definitely uh, a, a tearjerker. You're, you're definitely going to cry. Bring, bring a box of tissues to uh, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. But it's a good cry. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So is the documentary. Uh, right, exactly. Agreed. And this, this nails it. Cool. Same spirit. So my number five, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, out November 22nd, into our fours. 
Sweet. Uh, well, this will be quick for me. My number four was The Lighthouse. Oh. So. All right. Well, I guess that, that brings it over to me again. And this is where I slot in a sequel uh, for a movie that is arguably one of the best horror movies of all time. Dr. Sleep, mm-hmm. which is, I would call it the spiritual sequel, but it's not. It's a sequel to The Shining. Did you read the book by chance? No, not yet, man. So did you? No. I, I know your wife also is a big Stephen she, King. There did is she read a it? book. She, for... she did read it. She doesn't miss a single King book. And, and this wasn't one of her favorites, honestly. Ah. But I don't know if she likes The Shining that much. I'll, I'll have to delve into it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to read the book, hopefully, before this comes out. Um, but my time is short because this actually comes out... Uh, November, well, November 8th. So and I got a little Ewan bit McGregor in it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Ewan McGregor plays um, sort of a grown up version of Danny. He still has the shining, but now he's dealing with sort of the demons of the Torrance family. He's, a, he's been drinking, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And there's a cult. That's all I know. Uh, and once again, like sort of the demons of the past are, are coming back to haunt him. And the best shot, this is right in the trailer, is, is of him back at the Overlook Hotel looking through the door that his father chopped through with an axe in that famous here's mm-hmm. johnny and it's like almost like a shot for shot recreation of his face coming through it chills down my spine man that's such a vivid mem- uh you know image from my childhood i just like i i'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt but i'm kind of not interested in like seeing just like a like greatest hits of stanley kubrick you know, mm-hmm. I know there's a yeah, man, this this is this movie's got a, a really high bar to reach. And, yeah. and I don't know if it can, but I'm, I'm kind of down to see yeah. what happens. I mean, I love that Ewan McGregor is having kind of a little moment coming back. Uh, I feel like he, did he ever go away. I feel like he had a few years where he kind of slipped off. You know, he wasn't getting post those, Star Wars those big bigger ones. parts mm-hmm. or whatever. Hmm. And uh, I mean, I just love him. I, I think do he, too. I, Nice pick at number four. My number four film that I caught at the fest was Knives Out. Yeah. This is Ryan Johnson's latest film. Comes out November 27th. If you've seen the trailer, it is a murder mystery involving a a family that has great wealth. And the reason why they have have great wealth is the grandfather of the family actually writes murder mysteries. And... Mm. That ties in very nicely as he is the one who was murdered. And now, who did it kind of film unfolds. And the cast of characters is just fantastic. It's a total romp of a movie. It's, I would say, the best murder mystery I've seen in a long time. Um, I loved Tony Collette. I loved Daniel Craig in this movie. Really, the entire cast is fantastic. Yeah. So it's funny, but the mystery of it all is so well done also. I remember when... They recently remade The Murder on the Orient Express, and I didn't care for it. Complete opposite. Here, you're completely engrossed in who actually did the murder. Can they get away with it? Little plot twists going constantly. Does the audience know who done it, or do we get to sort of figure it out? Um, Believe it or not, you actually find out way earlier. It's not one of those moments like you wait until the very end. But then it becomes... Cat and mouse. Yeah, cat and mouse, and there's a couple of twists even knowing who did it and why there's still some some twists in there it's really well written and well cast it, it, you're going to laugh you're going to be into the movie this is probably the the film that I want to rewatch the most after seeing in in, in Toronto i'm yeah. like really excited to to dive back in and have a great time with this one nice when does it come out this one comes out november 27th okay so it it's says right the, around the thanksgiving. thanksgiving yeah yep i Perfect. love that that movie looks like what someone would guess that Ryan Johnson would be making 10 years on from Brick, Mm -hmm. like without all the Star Wars stuff. I just, I mean, if I see Brick and I see the trailer for that, I'm like, oh yeah. Of course. That makes sense. Um, So that's just, that's exciting. Um, Three for me is Ad Astra, uh, which, you know, I mean, it's just like, you just don't see that many like serious minded, big budget, sci-fi movies you see a little bit more of them like post annihilation and stuff but like i still just there is like a kind of integrity to the images that are in that trailer and i i'm just into it and i mean suffice to say lasers rovers on the moon (laughs) yeah it sold us the first time yeah (laughs) i mean i think ex machina sort of kicked that door open and then shows like black mirror and 
the success of that pretty yeah i've never thought about that before um totally and interstellar i mean like uh did it ex machina is that pre-interstellar throw it in the fish tank i think so i I think think it's a year after but ah, i could be wrong who knows yeah they're right around they're contemporaries within a year of each other i'm sure fish tank yeah good stuff all right that uh, brings it to me and at number three i have terminator dark fate you went there huh listen (laughs) One of the, you know what? I will even go as far as to say. <laughs> I don't say, even want this to, the movie to best, exist. <laughs> the best sequel of all time was Terminator 2, right? Sure. I, it's arguable, but but tough to argue. It's okay. definitely one of the best sequels of all time. No doubt. Mm-hmm. And then it was diminishing returns from there, and, and really very steeply diminishing returns from there. Well, yeah. All the other Terminator movies suck. I, in fact, don't even want to talk about them. But this one sort of looks like a return to form. Uh, Linda Hamilton is back. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is back. James Cameron is back. The whole just cr- producing though, just to clarify, yeah. he's not directing. That's very just important. Producing. I feel. Yep. I kind of agree, but he's busy doing blue giant movies. <laughs> so whatever. I'm 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 going all in on this. I think this is going to be the the actual sequel to T2 that we've mm. been waiting for. Mm. I don't know. Edward I'm, Furlong is I'm back. I'm not holding my breath. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Is he really? Yes, uh, he not is. Not really. He's, they they. He's wait wait. Do you have a scoop? Is, it is bonkers what they did for him he's not in the movie he did not act in the movie there is a body double that has his 90s face put onto it edward furlong is not involved in the production of this film wow you can check that but i believe that that is 100 check accurate. it throw it in the fish tank Get some dirt on this Edward Furlong story. Yeah, because yeah. I feel like I read a, an article that he was back. He's got this big physical transformation, lost all this weight. He's looking good. Mm. Uh, we'll see. Hmm. We'll see. Well, okay. you, you could be right, though. I don't know. But wow. anyway, regardless, I'm in for Terminator. I'm, I'm always interested. in for a Terminator movie. I'm worried about that one. All right, swings it over. My number three film I saw at the festival, Matt, was a comedy, but I was shocked how much the emotional punch hit me at the end. Tiki Watiti. We love this guy. Yeah. Taika. Taika Watiti. Yeah. We love this guy. October 18th, Jojo Rabbit. Hell yeah. This looks amazing and very strange. So I, I, this was the first, I was talking at the beginning about how early these movies play. So this is like 8.30 in the morning. It's Jojo Rabbit. And like the, the line of critics and press is just around the block. Everybody's so excited to get into this one. And it plays out hysterically. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to divide an audience for sure. It's a satire about... Hitler, the Nazis, yeah, right World there. War II, yeah. the Holocaust. And there's, there's definitely going to be some people that aren't going to be able to laugh at that. Mm-hmm. Not me, I laughed. I, it worked for me. I, I thought the comedy was hysterical. Think of Moonrise Kingdom a little bit at the beginning and mixed in with like a Mel Brooks satire film. So you get this idea of these young boys, uh, Jojo, who are actually training to be Nazi soldiers. Right. And he they're, has, they're the Hitler youth, right? Right. Yeah. They, and they're ridiculous training methods, right, as, as far as everything that they, they're throwing bombs and all this weird stuff. Right. Um, yeah, demented <laughs> Cub Scouts. Right, exactly. So it's, it's pretty hilarious. And Sam Rockwell plays their, uh, the teacher, you know, the, the, the leader teaching these kids. And Jojo also has visions of... Hitler, that he talks to Hitler. It's like his imaginary friend. Right. And that's played by... Taika. Taika Waititi. And wow, is it hilarious. Everything, every scene that he was in, I was laughing hysterically to the point like I was like kicking my legs, belly laughing. It was so damn funny. But the story then you start to care about, you know... Jojo. Jojo and also uh, a young girl that uh, is involved. And Jojo cares for this young girl. And it really does get Jojo to think outside of this idea that, you know, the propaganda of the, the Nazi army that he's been training for and everything that he knows, yeah. it, it gets him to start to realize that it could be all wrong. You know, he could be fed a bunch of lies here. And it ends with just a perfect note. I thought it was the just a perfect way to end this movie. Who plays the mom again? The mom is played by Scarlett Johansson. That's right. And she's great. And there's, there's a devastating scene in the middle of the movie that, that packs a, a, a emotional weight, and then it goes out on a high note. It, I walked out of the theater definitely thinking, and I'm not exaggerating here, I saw one of the best movies of the year. It's, <sighs> it's top ten for sure. Can I tell me. you why that trailer pissed me off? Please. Because Taika Waititi, and as a director, Taika Waititi 
gets to be so funny, so hot. As a like, directors should not be hot. That guy is good looking. He is a great writer. He's a great director, and he's hitting every single genre that he tries and just like succeeding effortlessly. I'm really mostly pissed about the hot thing. And then <laughs> he puts out this trailer, and he's like, "Also, I can make something that seems so." urgently culturally relevant right now and like I, I just know i'm gonna love that movie like i just uh yeah that eh, guy pisses me off it's a great one <laughs> but in like a mark Marin way yeah. i'm not really pissed <laughs> I, I well definitely want to mark be it down friend. it was third best movie i saw in toronto and uh, another one i'm excited to see again wow yeah definitely Joe, Joe rabbit definitely so, one i want to see indoor twos uh, let's see. Okay, number two, uh, Dolomite is my name. I, in, I don't know, like late teen years, uh, was my like investigation into black exploitation. Um, I had a friend who was really into just like schlocky uh, genre stuff. He showed me like trauma. And, and which Rai has thing. no idea about. Okay, I did not do much further investigation into because I don't like <laughs> gross things. But uh, yeah, which uh, one did you watch? Just curious, trauma wise. I think, you know, I can't even I can't even remember. I think it was also the first time I smoked weed. So I was dealing <laughs> Sounds with about some, right. Yeah, I was dealing with some other stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like I I've since like I know what trauma is now, and like it's I. Stamp of approval, but like I don't want to watch it. Fair, but yeah. So black exploitation, we we watched like a lot of famous black exploitation movies, and Dolomite was one of them. And uh, I mean, it's pretty funny. <laughs> and like, but I never thought about it. I never really like read books about you know like why it was funny or something. Now seeing the trailer for this movie, it's like, oh, this guy was kind of a comedian, you know? Um, I, like you've seen mm -hmm. the movie. So um, I have. And it's great to say that Eddie Murphy is really back with this role. This is an yeah. Eddie Murphy role. Yeah. And I think we've all been wanting that, to, to see him have that, that, yeah. that charisma that he has on, and bring it on the big screen again. This suits him perfectly. Yeah. It's, and this, it's awesome. And this was one of the red carpets that I got to do in Toronto. Did you get to talk to Eddie Murphy? I did. And I actually was a, a little starstruck, believe it or not, Matt. I believe it. it. <laughs> I, I didn't think we were going to get him. And, and when he actually stopped right in front of me and looked at me for the question, I, I literally lost it. There was probably like <laughs> three seconds of not talking. Did you say, what did the five fingers say to the face? <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What was I going to say? This is Eddie Murphy, you know? Yeah, for sure. But I did ask him, uh, just to give you a taste, because we're going to do a whole Dolomite show where we play a lot of the uh, uh, interview questions that we got with the whole cast. We talked to the, I got a chance to talk to the director. I uh, got to talk to Eddie Murphy. Cool. Um, talked to Wesley Snipes. And, and we're going to be playing Whoa. all of that on a, a special episode. But to give you a taste of it, I did ask Eddie Murphy, uh, what attracted him to doing uh, the Dolomite movie? Uh, Rudy Ray Moore's story is a great, inspiring story, and it was something that we'd been were trying to put together for almost 15 years. You know, it just came together. 15 years they were trying to put this thing together. It's a very long time, man. But we're hey, it's here now. Yep. So definitely check it out on Netflix. Yeah. All right, that swings it around to me. And you don't bet against Natalie Portman, okay? She has not consistently, usually. right, not usually. There's, there's been a few missteps, but they're few and far between. You look back at the track record like Black Swan, Jackie, Annihilation, the stuff that she chooses to do, what was that one, Vox Lux? Maybe not so much, but I'm, I'm really hoping that Lucy in the Sky... Gets it right back on track. It looks really interesting. Yeah. Another space movie. Mm -hmm. um, very, very trippy looking. Like, there's more going on. In fact, I think that space has less to do with this movie than the idea of our, um, how minuscule we are in, in, you know, before the vastness of the universe. I think Love that's it. what sort of blows her mind. But I have no idea. It looks like there's some, some trippy visuals. Um, and she's got a completely different look. But yet she's still... So Natalie Portman, like I just I love her in every role. I'm yeah. down for this one. I'm excited for this one as well. I did not see this one, so I'm I'm pumped to see this. 
So no, no Natalie Portman no. clip for mine. Boy, Jeez, would that be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. we could all just kind of like look up Natalie Portman YouTube clips for an hour. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I talked to Natalie Portman, and this is what she had to say. <laughs> just play the uh, Lonely Island rap yeah. that she does. Oh, oh I love crazy. that one. <laughs> All right, swings it over to my number two, and this uh, was probably the biggest surprise uh, that I saw at the festival, and I can't wait uh, till everybody sees this movie. Trey Edward Schultz, a director who has been on Cinema Jaw, he uh, did a, a phone-in interview when his uh, last movie, It Comes at Night, was on. He also directed Kresha, mm -hmm. and we had Kresha Fairchild on Cinema Jaw as well. His latest film is entitled Waves, and this movie completely blew me away. Comes out November 1st, and it, the film is told in two acts. The first act follows uh, an African-American teenager who feels a ton of pressure on him to succeed in life. He's, he's wrestling in high school, and eventually he gets his girlfriend pregnant, and everything starts to come apart on him. And then the second act of the film follows his sister and, and the rest of his family, as their lives change by decisions Tyler made in the first act. I think the title of the film, Waves, is a reference to the way one, one's actions flows into another's and what actions they then have to make because of the actions someone else before them made. Uh, the energy of this film bounces off the screen. It, it's incredible, his use of colors. He's got the, this great way of like uh, dissolving into scenes into just like three colors onto the screen. Mm. And you know I'm a huge Radiohead fan. Mm. I would actually say the movie was already a masterpiece when a particular Radiohead song comes on. But wow, this just took it even to a higher level. I, there wasn't a, a, a dry eye in the theater. It was so powerful. It's one of those where you could hear sniffling at the end throughout the entire movie house. A lot of crying. I would actually relate this maybe to this year's Moonlight as being like a small movie that just packs a ton of emotion. And, it, and it's just a... A tender movie. It's it, you're gonna love it. It's awesome. So do see this one. Nice. Uh, Into our number ones. Yeah, Peter. So what are you most excited for? Number one. I didn't even do this on purpose, but I noticed afterwards. Uh, this is out right now, so I'm probably gonna just go see this. Maybe even tonight. Um, Hustlers. I am super excited for this movie. Uh, it's just like I had no really like I heard the plot for it, and I was kind of like, oh, okay. I don't, all right, moving on. And then I saw the trailer and it's just like, this movie looks like it's gonna rock. <laughs> I mean, um, it's it got just, Jennifer Lopez in it. Jennifer, I mean, the cat, yeah, I feel like every movie that I've done, I've just been like, and the cast is crazy, but like, the cast is crazy. Uh, Jennifer Lopez, um, I didn't write down even the rest of the people in it. Um, Lizzo's in there, which is cool. Lizzo rocks. Uh, and it's a female director, Lorraine, I'm, Sorry, I'm absolutely butchering this name. Uh, Lorene Scafaria, who did, uh, she wrote Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist um, and then directed and wrote uh, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, mm -hmm. um, which I've never seen. But the early reviews for this movie are just like, you know, uh, that it's a really good Is this movie. the Wall Street one where? No. Oh, which well, one is Well, it has to do well, with Wall Street. Yeah, but... Uh, but they're also, uh, they're strippers in the movie, aren't they? Well, it's about strippers essentially hustling Wall Street guys. Okay. Right, yeah. And it, like, uh, apparently, you know, was an actual thing that happened. Um, and there's just kind of, like, you know, there's, like, kind of a, like, B-movie sort of vibe. But you can also tell it felt kind of Wolf of Wall Street-y to me in that it's like, it looks very fun, but it also looks like, you know, it's gonna be about real people with like real like motivations and problems and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's actually an empowering feminist movie as it's being billed as, but it has the potential to be. You know, one of the fun things of uh, the Toronto Fest is that you get the buzz of other things going on. And so it premiered there. Yeah. And I, not being a big J-Lo fan, I never really even gave it a try to go put it in my schedule. Mm. I just didn't even write it down. Sure. And she then, doesn't do that many great movies. The, the, yeah, right. And then the next day, like, you're at a screening, and you can hear people talking about it. And then you see it on social media, and then you run into, 
you know, another critic friend and they're like, did you see Hustlers? It's incredible. Yeah. So the buzz in and around the festival was very high on this movie for the people that saw it. We're going to have to get so. a review of this one. Yeah, for sure. Good. Good on JLo, man. Mm-hmm. She, she deserves a, a, a breakout. All right, uh, guys, if you didn't guess this one, shame on you. My number one is Joker, for sure. Comes out on my birthday, October 4th. Extremely excited to go to the movies on my birthday and see the Joker. All the buzz around this one is that it's uh, another career best from Joaquin Phoenix. Like, it's it's just uh, a crazy, crazy role. There's sort of some mixed reviews from what I've been hearing, but uh, that only Some intrigues mixed me. Thoughts, certainly. Yes. Yeah. yeah that only intrigues me more. Yeah. I, I like a divisive film. I like a film that makes people angry. Yeah. You know, something that at least evokes a, a real reaction out of people. So, I guess I just I don't like Batman. I feel like it's gonna be a solid movie. I'm also really scared of a certain portion of the population latching onto it. You know, because like you mean the fanboys, the like alt-right oh you I think mean, so oh yeah really I mean, okay so like 2008 dark knight comes out and then suddenly like this type of person latches onto the whole like you know joker image of just kind of like introduce a little chaos don't Different. get me wrong i know it's about a mentally ill person that like has you know he's not portrayed as like you know the you want to be this guy right but I've also heard that by the end of the film, it kind of like eschews the uh, like very grim character portrait into kind of embraces him, embraces him in kind of like a celebratory way, which I feel like some people might go a little nuts with. Right. The comparisons to Taxi Driver are, are all over the place. Yeah. I've, you know. Travis. King of Comedy seems like the bigger one to me. Yeah, never seen King of Comedy. I've seen so good. seen Taxi Driver num- number of times. Yeah, so well, no, hmm. I'm not going to see the movie. But I want to see. I, okay, I mean, but it looks good. Like I'm not going to say it doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, Joaquin I mean, Phoenix it, looks amazing. Right, but like the horrible skinny, actions of other people skinny, on the but, internet, notwithstanding, this looks like a good movie. Very it's, bony. I hear it's a very physical performance from Joaquin. Yeah, so. We will definitely be seeing that one. My number one movie that I saw at the Toronto International Film Festival, 20 films all told that I saw. My number one is by a director that we are big fans of, Bong Joon-ho, who did Snowpiercer and Oakjaw, Mm -hmm. has made a masterpiece, Matt. Mm -hmm. And it is entitled Parasite. Comes out October 11th, and everybody who saw this movie at the fest was had this at if not their favorite in their top three movies that they saw it's a story of uh, a poor korean family their oldest son gets asked by a friend to help tutor english to a girl from a wealthy family and to do that he has to act like he's in college himself and he's quite a fraud and he goes to the the family and he sees how gullible this this family with all this money actually is that they they believe everything that he's selling and from there he actually is able to recruit other people to help at the house fooling them a little bit and i don't want to go too much further because it's a little ways out but of course it's it's hysterical in a way i mean some of the 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 dialogue here is fantastic and and the situations that these characters get involved in the story how he came up with the idea of where this thing goes and how crazy it gets and demented it gets is just unreal. So the story is off the hook, and the ending, it ends with a finale that we'll, we'll be talking about from years from, now, years from now, Matt. Dude, I'm trying to remember that movie. We reviewed it a couple years ago, maybe three or four years ago. It starts with a K about a guy who starts out as a sort of a, um, a transient house guest, but he worms his way into the family, and one by one, he replaces the help with his helpers. You, do you remember this movie? You know what I'm talking about? Mm-mm. There's this one scene where he's on the bed, naked, hovering over the wife. He's just, like, perched on her bed. Like, he was the bringer of bad dreams. Mm-hmm. Do you know who I'm talking? Throw it in the fish tank. Oh. Where they, he, he would hang the people that died upside down in the water. With, yeah, I remember that. Okay. Is, Throw it in the fish tank. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very funny, dark comedy. Seems like it has a similar premise. Mm-hmm. 
They're very right on with that. Okay, cool. So, uh, Parasite was a, a, a total blast. It's so level. cool. So, Bong Joon Ho has just been batting. I don't even know baseball terms, but he's just hitting it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's so good. Really good. Uh, uh, famously, Elias, our, our, our good buddy, hated Akja. Really? Yeah. The the machine gun poop. He just hard he disagree. Just didn't like it. Yep. Hard disagree here. Yeah. Honorable mentions. Other films that I saw. Uh, quick recaps at Toronto. Ford v Ferrari. This uh-huh. is Matt Damon. Christian Bale tells the true story of Ford uh, was trying to you know, pick up sales, and they said, "What we got to do is actually race Ferrari and beat Ferrari," and it's based on a true story of how Ford, in in a very short period of time, actually made a better, faster car than Ferrari and won the Le Mans race. It's, it's quite incredible. Lighthouse, we've already talked about. And what would a list be without a Nick Cage fall movie? Hell He's got yeah. a new one coming out entitled Color Out of Space. And this is another crazy, weird sci-fi movie, uh, a little bit like Mandy. It's, it's high caliber Nick Cage, and he goes absolutely ballistic. Sweet. The place was laughing hysterically at some of uh, Nick Cage's big moments on screen and one word for you on the movie alpaca after you see it you'll get the joke alpaca (laughs) and then one hidden gem for you the climb which was about uh, a friendship between uh, two friends as one's about to get married they go for a bike ride up this mountain hence the climb and it's a a friendship that is uh, pushed to the max very funny film Hmm. george went actually pops up small role in the movie norm yep good to see george went back in it uh had a blast out there. A lot of great films, and we'll be talking about them all. I got, a, fall. I got a couple. Go ahead. Uh, Rambo, Last Blood. <laughs> all right, pass. No, let's. Uh, <laughs> I'm no, excited. We're not I'm even excited. Gonna, we're, all right. Well, almost. The, the, almost the, the laundromat. Okay, I've seen the Same. laundromat. I've seen the laundromat and quality. Uh, Three from Hell, Rob Zombie's uh, cap on the trilogy of the uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. Um, Zombie Land, Double Tap. We didn't mention The Irishman. And there's uh, Lupita Nyongo has a follow-up, I guess, of sorts called Little Monsters, which is about um, her as a kindergarten teacher taking a group of kids on a field trip to a petting zoo where a zombie outbreak happens. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> the, the guy that plays Olaf, the voice of Olaf from Frozen. Throw it in the fish tank. Yeah. One more. Pops up. That doesn't pop up. He's basically the other lead. Who, who's wait, wait. Josh Gad. Josh Gad. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, th- they sort of uh, play off one another. It looks like what um, the dead don't die should have been. Mm. So I have hope, mm. but it's not. I too didn't hard. even bother to see that one. I know, fell flat. Should yeah. have been amazing. The trailer didn't even do it for me. Me I neither. But I, I was still holding out hope. Any honorables for you, Peter? Totally. Um, laundromat was an honorable for me. Um, I think the only reason it wasn't in top five was just because I got kind of tainted by a, a review that was like middling mm-hmm. about it. Um, but the whole, I mean, uh, I just watched this Steve Soderbergh movie last night, The Limey, which is on Mubi oh, right now. The Limey. Uh, so weird. He did it's, that? Yeah. That's funny. Um, it was cool to see Terrence Stamp do that uh, mm-hmm. in the same year that he did Phantom Menace as the Chancellor, uh, which is just some super nerdy stuff from me. Um, okay. Judy is on mine. I've yeah. seen um, Judy. And, and as I said at the top of the show, unbelievable by, yeah. by Renee Zellweger. I mean, she looks great in that. Um, Gemini Man. Yeah. Uh, With Will Smith. Yeah. Give him, uh, giving me crap about Rambo, but no. No, no. I'll, I'll take a Gemini Man. I'm excited for that. I mean, Gemini Man just looks insane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does it? I don't know. It's it, a Will Smith playing Will Smith twice. But it's Ang Lee, and he's doing his high frame rate thing again. He's mm-hmm. done some bad movies. Let's not forget Mission not, Impossible 2. Stop bringing him. No, he didn't do no, that. No, that was not Ang Lee. No, no. that was... Um, that was uh, uh, John Woo. It was, it was John, John Woo. Was John I, it was John Woo. Right. Sorry, I, I stand corrected. Um, Ang Lee just got off of the like enormous failure of uh, uh, the halftime walk. Right. Um yeah, some guy's name's long halftime walk, and it was another crap movie. We didn't like that one. But what he was trying to do with that movie, with the like high frame rate and 3D, I mean, you got yeah. Will Smith. There we go. He's trying to shoot himself, but young. It's gonna be interesting. I mean, <laughs> yeah. 
body double. If we missed your most anticipated movie. Oh, wait, oh, wait one sorry, more. Sorry. One more. Uh, Villains, which is a South by Southwest premiere. You guys know about that? No. Yeah, I actually did see this one. Did you? Yeah. Was it good? Okay. Okay. But I seem to be in, in the minority there. Okay. Uh, I saw it at a late night screening at the Chicago Film Critics uh, Festival. It and looked to me... I wasn't the biggest fan. Okay. I, I kept getting like Bottle Rocket meets early Tarantino mm. vibes from it. It looked like a young director who is really influenced by Tarantino, but the trailer also, you know, made me go, whoa, a bunch. So like, that's cool. I like that. All right. If we missed your most anticipated fall movie and you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw or email us feedback at CinemaJaw.com. What we're going to do, Matt, is take a quick break. When we come back, we have a review of... Art Paul of Playboy, the man behind the bunny. Wow. Plus, yourself first, Peter, in Brad Pitt movie trivia. Stick with us. Whew. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's and now Nicole Kidman gives a pep talk to her son Let's in the 2018 the film Aquaman. We'll go with you. We can fight it together. No. It's too powerful. I've tried many times over the years. The creature will only allow the true king to pass. You're afraid. Yes. Good. You're ready. Atlantis has always had a king. Now I need something more. But what could be greater than a king? A hero. A king fights only for his nation. You fight for everyone. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. Hey everyone, I want to dedicate this episode to the memory of Jesse Granton, and my thoughts are with his brother Josh, who's a good friend of mine and a jawhead for a long time. Love you, man. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Peter Collins Campbell, who has a new film in uh, post-production here. It's getting ready to come out entitled Dimland, but I did want to ask that uh, you mentioned briefly that you had made a short film entitled, entitled Summer Vacation. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about the short. Sure. The short was mostly made in like 2017 or something. Um, I was doing a lot of music videos at that time and starting to really get close to burnout uh, just because I was starting to do a lot of projects that I just knew like would pay my rent, which, you know, I have since realized for music videos, you just can't expect. Some of my like favorite music video directors have gone on record uh, just saying like, they get nothing. I was just starting to do stuff that I wasn't excited about. And it's very, very, very tough for me to put in two months of work onto something that, you know, maybe the song doesn't speak to me or something. Uh, and I wasn't even satisfied with the work I was making. I was really just kind of like lost. And uh, then at some point I just like sat down and started spilling out ideas onto a page and just in kind of like a almost manic fit, like did the entire pre-production for this thing. That's what I was going to ask you about. You, you yeah. wrote this thing in like three days, right? Something crazy like that. Well, that's Dimland that he wrote yeah, in three days. Yeah, Dimland I wrote in three days. Uh, and then there was like four more drafts after that. <laughs> well, of course. Um, but yeah, the short film uh, was just kind of like a a way for me to just be like, okay, man, well, you've been doing all this work for like several years. What happens if you put the amount of effort that you do into like any of these music videos into a short? And so we did that, um, called in a lot of favors, got a lot of help from Camera Ambassador and Erica Duffy, uh, who also helped out a lot on Dimland. Uh, and she produced the film. And then it was like a year of post-production for a five-minute short film. Wow. Uh, every single shot was an After Effects sequence. Um, and that was uh, really grueling and led me to never do that many effects again. <laughs> <laughs> Dimland has like, I mean, there's, there's effects, but like only 
when we really minimal. Needed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the result of doing all of that was finally having something that like could get into festivals. And that has been one of the best and most affirming experiences next to just making dim land. Mm-hmm. Um, just like getting out there, meeting other people that are doing the exact same thing, like, uh, and traveling for something that you made is like, uh, so just mind blowing. And like, yeah, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience for the Jawheads. Is there a place online that we can now view summer vacation? Yeah, we, we premiered it online at the end of July. Uh, and you can find that on, on my Vimeo. Um, I guess, uh, for anyone that follows the website director's notes, we premiered it with them. We can throw a link in the show notes too. Yeah, totally. There's, uh, yeah, it's just uh, my my Vimeo is uh, vimeo.com slash Peter Films. And uh, if you just type in like my name and summer vacation on Google, it'll probably come up. Awesome. It's a quick watch. All right. Before we get to the next review and before we get to some Brad Pitt movie trivia, we threw a few items into the fish tank. I know Phil wants to swim up top. Tell us what we missed, what we got wrong. Let's open up that fish tank. Wait a moment. It's fish, isn't it? DC, wake up, wake up. No, Pat, it's a giant glass bowl. Hey, get some fish, folks. Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's just a second message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're going to need a bigger boat. Thank you so much for letting me out tonight, guys. Uh, We do have a lot of questions, so I won't spend too long on this. But since I am very vain, I do want to plug myself for a moment and just wish wish myself a very happy birthday. Mostly because... Happy birthday. Oh, Oh, hey, dude. Happy happy birthday. birthday. I make 26 look very good. Uh... (laughs) And it, uh, it amidst the existential crises uh, and We're being here. off of my mother's insurance, I could use the birthday wishes. Yeah, I feel you, man. That is so scary. <laughs> here we are going on and on about our 10-year anniversary. We, f- we forgot to say happy hey, birthday I to Phil. I said happy birthday to Phil way earlier today. I think everybody has a, a different points throughout the night. but uh, And a commitment to the jaw. I show up on my birthday. Um, but it's fun. It's a good time. It's a good night. Uh, anyways, let's jump on in because there is a lot of stuff. Is the Eight Slices Anthology out now? Uh, it is currently released. It's making the festival circuits, and it has been doing so for about a year. I could not find any streaming links, but I did send Matt the link to their Facebook page where they do have all information on every screening that they have. So just want to say Eight Slices is not the anthology horror movie. That's the pizza movie. Yes. Yes, okay. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Um, yes, the pizza movie with like eight different people uh, sharing a pizza. Our next one, what did Won't You Be My Neighbor make in the box office? It actually sits very pretty at $22 million. Wow. See, that's it, huge wow. for a documentary. That is yeah. big for a doc. Huge. It is the highest grossing bio doc of all time. Uh, and uh, according to boxofficemojo.com, it is about... Eight million dollars more than the average grossing film, which comes in at about fourteen million. Just for the sake of comparison, though, in cultural relevance, the the highest grossing is Avengers: Endgame, which is two point seven in uh, billion. billion. Bill, yes, billion, <laughs> one hundred twenty-two times more seen than than. Wow. So that's what neighbor. I'm trying to get at here. I, I still think more people need to see this. Right, but totally. but from me and, and and Peter, we were saying for a documentary, it was. Well, it was well, well received. Seen. Yes, yeah. that and RGB were like the yeah. heavy huge. hitters. Huge, huge. Yeah. This is a great year for docs. Yeah. Our next one did Ex Machina or Interstellar come out first? So it it gets a little hairy with like festival premieres and stuff. So I'm not counting those. I'm just thinking about the the general admission uh, when everybody could see it. And technically, Interstellar came out November fifth, two thousand fourteen, and edges out Ex Machina by two months. Uh, Ex Machina came out January 21st, 2015. So huh. hmm. they were very really close. close. Very, very, very close. Very close. Uh, <laughs> the next one, I uh, uh, did a deep dive on the Edward Furlong face mapping. Oh, I, I for, can't wait to hear this. Am I wrong? I feel like I'm probably wrong. <laughs> a little column A, a little column B. Ooh. So Edward Furlong and his full presence is is in the film. Uh, 
However, there are absolutely definitely scenes uh, that are supposed to be flashbacks uh, in which he, he's supposed to be the younger. Uh, it's reminiscent of the films of the 90s. And in those, he actually is body doubled and face mapped onto a different person. Interesting. So some of the time he is, other times he's not. But Eddie Furlong is in the movie. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. I guess I, I I had a hard time believing it because didn't he kind he, didn't he kind of fall off the, the yeah <laughs> this is his this <laughs> is his <laughs> return we'll see that's interesting it, it's crazy to think what they're going to be doing with actors with all this face mapping and body doubles and flashbacks it, it's it's, it's going like, to be insane it, in it, the next it's like Congress yeah it really is yeah it really is you know the thing with Gemini Man right like that it's it's not like the it's not the Irishman thing it's not the de-aging he, yeah right it's a different person that is fully cgi recreated from like images of will smith yeah which it, is nuts like what apparently it's like the result is better than like the de-aging thing in yeah. their opinion or whatever i guess we'll find out we will mm-hmm. find out Alrighty, then our last one, which was uh, the the movie that Matt told me to look up. I will start by giving out a cautionary tale. This was very difficult to find, and I didn't have much to go off or uh, off of. But whatever you do, do not look up the search query "perched over wife's bed naked" movie. <laughs> <laughs> that was a scene from the film. A very like it's a scene from a lot of films, Matt. Not the kind of films Is you it? want to talk this about. This is a work computer, Matt. Um, <laughs> but uh, after finding far too much pornography, I did enlist Ryan's help. So uh, I, as much of a fish tank segment as it is, I do have to give credit to Ryan for finding it out. That was the 2013 film Borgman you were thinking of, Matt. Yes, yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> That's a wild one. It is. It's a good movie. It is. Borgman. I'm going to write that down. Yep. That's a good flick. Was that everything, Phil? That is all we got. All right. Jump back in there, fish tank. we Will do. All right, Matt. You caught a, a, a screening of a movie. Yes, I did. Art Paul of Playboy, the man behind the bunny. You think of iconic logos, Ryan. You think of the Nike swoosh, maybe the the Target circles. McDonald's arches. There you go. The Playboy bunny definitely stands the test of time as one of the most iconic logos ever. And who is the person that created that? We all think about Hugh Hefner. Uh, Regardless of your feelings toward the publication Playboy, it's true that it was sort of a touchstone for culture, especially art culture of the time, literary culture too. And Art Paul was the art director of Playboy magazine for the first 30 years of the publication, something which is relatively, as I learned from watching this documentary, unheard of in the magazine world. Mm -hmm. Art directors come and go, usually new editors come on and clean house. Not the case with Art Paul. He was beloved. He was the man behind the bunny, as, as is the title of the film, and that's about it. I, I'm sad to say, as interesting as that premise is, and, and we do get to learn a lot about Art Paul and, and all the things that he did, he's a very successful artist in his own right beyond just Playboy, but it's very surface level. It's very puffy. Hmm. The thing that makes this film special is somewhat personal. To, to us at Cinema Jaw, at least, I was watching the movie and totally blindsided when Max Temkin from Cards Against Humanity pops up what? as one of the talking heads in this movie. Wait, Max is in the film? Max is in the movie. <laughs> He's one of the, 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 the cultural experts they talk to to sort of frame uh, Art Paul and his, and his relevance in, in art culture. And then it goes even further, and right outside these studio walls... Uh, the, the camera is following Art Paul, who's in his 90s, walking down our little hallway huh. where his art is hanging up on the walls they, at wow. Cards Against Humanity. So we must have seen his artwork then. I don't know. I don't remember ever seeing it. I think this might have predated us by just a little bit. Hmm. Interesting. Right. I feel like I would have remembered it. Um, here's the thing. There is a lot of divisive feeling about the publication Playboy magazine. Some people really hate it. I think it exploits women. uh, And especially in in today's day and age, I think that deserves a little bit of exploration. They barely touch on it, barely Mm. at all. There's a little bit of lip service paid to that. And I'm not in that camp, to be completely honest. That's not my personal feelings on the matter. But they, they have one pundit who is like, well, you know, Art Paul, yeah, he's great, but I can't really give him any credit because he worked for that piece of crap magazine Playboy. And, and she's heard from a couple of times. 
I think that could have been the other side of the coin could have been shown a bit more. And it is very much a talking head documentary. It's a tough call with all of that. What do you I mean? mean? Like the cultural conversation. It's a very it, tough call. But know? that'd be a more interesting film is what you're saying. I that mean, is a tough exactly call about including like if you're doing, I mean, I feel like you're probably like totally on the money with this, but like uh, how much to include of like, you know, and then also the publication had all of these repercussions in the world, you know, if they're trying to focus on like his life, but I don't know. Yeah. It's not a movie about Playboy magazine. Right. Except that it is because Art Paul was everything about Playboy that wasn't the boobs. Yeah. I mean, so you open a Playboy magazine um, from the first 30 years and even beyond that into the 90s, perhaps. And and you do get some brilliant artists working on those pages. It, I mean, it's great that we have a Playboy expert in, in the studio with us. <laughs> Guys, I mean, come on. I mean, you really did. Where else? I mean, t- listen, I'm going to be honest here. We, we all hid Playboy magazines under our beds when we were like 10, 11, 12 years old. And I don't think there's another place back then before the Internet where I would have seen artwork like this. I mean, Shel Silverstein got his start in, in Playboy magazine. So many literary giants, too, like like um, Vonnegut. Yeah. I mean, the list is is humongous. So there's a huge argument is is it culturally relevant or is it pornography or is it both and and i don't know and i don't know that that's what this documentary was meant to tackle yeah. but i think it would have been a little bit more interesting had they delved into that story a bit more totally and and i like i was started to mention about the talking head stuff that's all it is it's and i hate that style of documentary it's very vh1 where you, you go from pundit to pundit and you know these are great people and and their opinions are are expert and i do want to hear from them but i'm a fan of documentary that frames it a bit better we were talking earlier about um won't you be my neighbor which i think did this just expertly there there were talking heads but you didn't get that lower third graphic pop up every time they were on the screen we learned who they were in the story and in the context of mr rogers world and then it flowed through organically not the case unfortunately with art paul of playboy Um, It's interesting. I did learn a lot about a guy who is a huge figure in pop art and and how his his sort of coup of of being an art director for this magazine, he just used to meet people like Andy Warhol and Salvador Dali and get them into the pages of this magazine. But I think it's a little surface level. I think it's a little too loving. We don't get the warts and all. How many jaws are you giving this one, man? I give it a two as a documentary. It's it's interesting personally, like I said, because if you're if you're a jawhead and you want to see what uh, the outside of our studio looks like, you should check this out. Uh, y- you can't miss it, and it's it's nice to see Max pop up in a movie that was weird. <laughs> but uh, you know, as as a documentary fan, I, I do expect. Have you talked to Max about it? No, I was gonna drop him a line today on Slack and say, "Hey, I saw you in this movie. I thought it was pretty cool, dude." That's funny. That is, it's right in the conference room nice. where they're interviewing him. It's, you know, unmistakable with the those red uh, mm-hmm. shipping containers in the background. <laughs> it's it was, awesome. It was very cool. All right. Good stuff. Uh, it does bring us to trivia. We like to end on a, on a fun segment here. And in honor of Brad Pitt's new astronaut movie, Ad Astra, we are playing Brad Pitt movie trivia. Peter, it works like this. You're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on any question, you get one trip into the fish tank for a fill-me-in Phil okay. who has clues to all the questions. They do start off easy. Uh, Should be noted. Let's just they get jump easy, in. I'll, I'll go first. And then they get harder as we go on. Question number one over to Peter in Brad Pitt Movie Trivia. Here we go. Brad Pitt has starred in two films directed by Quentin Tarantino. One of them came out this year, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Name the other. Inglorious Bastards. One to nothing, Peter. Question two over to Matt K. Matt, Brad Pitt starred in the movie Seven. What actor played John Doe in the film? Kevin Spacey. Get the easy ones out of the way. One to one. Everybody, everybody breathe. Question three back over to Peter. Brad Pitt starred in the film The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, where he falls in love with Daisy. Which actress played Daisy in the film? Kate Blanchett. I would have got that wrong. Yeah? Yeah. Never saw it. 
Can I say something? Sure. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, so, <laughs> speaking of David Fincher, uh, big Mindhunter fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just, I need to air this out. I spent the entirety of this recent season that came up thinking that the third lead of that series was Kate Blanchett. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I showed my girlfriend the, the, the first episode and I was like, just wait till the third lead comes in. Just wait till, the, and then it introduces the doctor. And I was like, Kate Blanchett, series lead. And she was like, I don't think that's no. who you think that is. It's, it's, it, it, it does was, look like it. I, I'm watching Mindhunter. I'm not through with season two yet. But. I cannot even begin to understand what brain <laughs> face blindness happened that's there. so funny anyway sorry all right it is two to one peter back on track here two to one peter question four over to matt k matt okay brad pitt has appeared on screen in one movie with jonah hill name the film hmm uh, don't think brad pitt pops up at all in super bad yeah or Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> I'm trying to think of another Jonah Hill picture right off the top of my head. Brad Pitt has appeared on screen in one movie with Jonah Hill. 21 Jump Street. Incorrect. Peter, you got a chance for a steal and to mm-hmm. take a commanding 3-1 to one lead. Moneyball. Damn. Damn. And you like that movie, I love Matt. that movie. Wow. 3-1, to one, Peter. Love that movie. And question five is over to him. Peter... Brad Pitt has appeared in one film with Orlando Bloom. It came out in 2004. Name it. Is it Troy? Okay. Wow. Not a good movie. No. Four <laughs> to one, Peter. Four to one. I wouldn't have gotten that one right and either. And he was worried about this one. Question six bounces back over to Matt K. Matt, in 2014, mm-hmm. Brad Pitt made a war movie in which he's part of of an army tank team name the film fury four to two keeping it a ball game still still got some life i didn't see it i just remember the title i haven't seen it either and i don't like david ayer at all it's actually a pretty decent war movie i liked fury he he did that other one where he he well this might come up later uh where he did that weird accent he was the the commander and oh oh maybe it comes up question number seven (laughs) Question number seven. In 2017, Brad Pitt made a Netflix movie in which he played the general in the army. Name the film. The general? In no, the, yeah, a general in the, in the army. The United States Army? Yeah. So in 2017, Brad Pitt was in a Netflix movie in which he played a general in the army. Name the film. You do have a lifeline if you need it. And I'm going to do the lifeline. Whoa, uh. fill me in, Phil. Question seven. What was the name of that Brad Pitt Netflix movie? All right, Peter, your clue is he put on a weird accent. <laughs> he already <laughs> said that. That's not, that's not that's Okay. Not the real <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, the birthday boy made it funny. <laughs> uh, the real clue this week, Peter, <clears throat> the actual title is better than its analogy, Combat Mechanism. Say that again? The real title is better than Combat Mechanism. But it's like that term? Mm. Oh, War Machine. Wow. Phil, good clue. Damn it, I knew that one. (laughs) Five to two, it's all over. Last question of the game, over to Matt K. Matt, name the 2016 movie in which Brad Pitt and Marion Cotillard played World War II operatives and fell in love. Fill me in, Phil. Whoa! Back to back, fill me in, Phil. Phil, what was the name of that Brad Pitt, Marion Cotillard film? I already met your clue this week. Another word for two people joined together. Two people joined together. Mm. It could be, could be twins, could be married. Mm. Um, World War II movie. Mm. Um, married to the mob. <laughs> it's, it's married to the mob. Michelle Pfeiffer was also in it, right? Peter, you got a chance for a steal. Allied. It's not two. Wow. Nobody says two people joined together are allied. That is. He had the good clue. 
I said it was World a World War, War II, II movie. movie. If you think about you... World War II and the clue, I think Allied works. I mean, how clue. else would you define Allied, Matt? Two countries working together. Wow. Second mm. question, did anyone see Allied I ever? did not. <laughs> I cannot say that I have. The movie disappeared. The important thing is here, Peter wins this one six to two. Wow. Clobbers, Matt K. Can I get a handshake? <laughs> and he was worried. A, a handshake about this. They are shaking hands. Wonderful. If it came down to a, a tie, a jawbreaker, we call it here, Peter, this question would have been over to you. Better Brad Pitt roll, Fight Club or Seven? Hmm. He's definitely having a lot more fun in Fight Club. Uh, I guess Fight Club. Incorrect. It is Seven. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. The real jawbreaker. I think I'd rather watch Seven at this point. Real jawbreaker was this. This is a toss-up. Yeah. I, I love Fight Club. So They're both I, great. Yeah, they really are. It, real jawbreaker is this. Age of Orlando Bloom. Closest Holy crap. to Matt, you got to guess on Legolas on Bloom. himself, huh? I would guess 43. Lock him in at 43, Phil. Peter, do you got to guess? I was about to say 42. He's 42 years old. Wow. <laughs> Jesus wow. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know. I don't know. That Unbelievable. That <laughs> he was meant to win this one, Matt. Yeah. I did not know that I knew anything about Brad Pitt, to be honest. <laughs> or Orlando Bloom. I recently, I listened to an episode of the podcast Blank Check about Elizabeth Town, and they talk a lot about Orlando Bloom. Also, Orlando Bloom's episode of Easy is one of my favorite pieces of acting that he's ever done. So he's been on my brain recently. And he has a new great. show out called Carnival Row. Very skeptical of that. Have not watched it yet. Yeah, with the fairies. But, and but I, I'm semi-interested. At least the look of it looks pretty they got intriguing. Orlando Bloom and Cara Delevingne. Neither are really known for anything but being really pretty. Well, it's a steampunk version of Bright. Brings us to the end of a great Cinema Jaw. First and foremost, we got to thank our guest. Peter, thanks for coming on Cinema Jaw. Thank you, guys. Great meeting you, guy. Yeah. It was awesome. And, and when uh, Dimland is, is out in theaters and stuff, you got to come back. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, it was so fun. We also got to thank our engineer, the birthday guy, inside the fish tank, Phil Me and Phil. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and also, happy birthday to you guys, too. Happy 10 years. We, that so is we, amazing. We, we sort of timed that out perfectly. Yes. Matt, we also got to thank... Our sponsors. Yes. Thanks to Cards Against Humanity and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get cool sponsors like them. If you want to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so is by leaving us a review wherever, wherever you are listening to this podcast. And while you're there, click subscribe. One extra button helps us out tremendously. Until next week, I'm Ryan, the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on John about the movies. movies.